When I began this Sermon on the Mount series, which now feels like forever ago, and actually was over three months, I had no idea how long this would last. And so, as it has continued for so many weeks, I think this is week 13 or 14 or something, I keep trying to shorten it and do bigger chunks of material in each week. And each week, God says, what is your hurry? So in case you weren't paying attention, it took us forever to get through Matthew chapter 5. We are moving faster through Matthew chapter 6. I just want to remind you that as we get into Matthew chapter 6, the first four verses dealt with giving. The next chunk, the next 10 and 11 verses, dealt with praying. Today, we are going to deal with fasting in three verses. What's interesting, and you may not know this, but as Jesus was giving this Sermon on the Mount, he was specifically addressing the abuses of people in the church on these three subjects of giving, praying, and fasting. You may remember a couple weeks ago when we talked about giving, he talked about don't give so that everybody knows. Don't put your name on the side of a building. Don't make a big grandiose effort out of contributions to the work of God. We talked about praying it was all about humility. And last week we delved in depth into the Lord's Prayer. And this week we're going to talk about fasting, which oddly enough ties in completely to praying a continuation of the subject through different means. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, specifically verses 16, 17, and 18. Matthew 6, 6, 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So one of the things that's always interesting when you cover this topic is if I was to take a poll in the church this morning and ask how many of you have fasted, I'm not sure we'd see a lot of hands. It's not a common modern day practice for most of us. Maybe because we don't understand what it is for, Maybe because we don't really know how to do it, or we don't know the purpose of do it. Or how, specifically, to do it. I'm going to cover, I hope, all of those this morning. So what does fasting mean? Literally, fasting means to not eat. That's literally what it means. If you're taking a fast, you are not eating. Let me define this biblically, though, a little differently. Pay attention to these words. Fasting for biblical purposes is the giving up of something of value, commonly food, in order to focus on seeking God over some matter. So fasting is the giving up of something typically food, in order to focus seeking God over some matter. So to put in Mikey Lehman terms, you don't fast for nothing. You fast for something. See, this is often why it's a practice that we don't normally use today because we don't normally think of praying specifically for some direction in our lives, or some end result, or some accomplishment. 
So many of us pray because we're supposed to, because we're taught that we should pray. But fasting is a way, a method, a practice, a discipline, you might say, to enhance our prayer life. There is no reason why anyone in here cannot fast. Because you don't have to fast for days on end. So I thought it would be appropriate to look into Scripture and see if they fasted at all. Well, there's lots, lots of examples in Scripture of fasting. First one, Exodus 34, 28, talking about Moses who fasted for 40 days while he was receiving the Ten Commandments. Exodus 34, 28 specifically says he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. He wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. That was clearly a miraculous fasting because you could not survive if you did not eat or drink for 40 days. You would not make it. That was a miraculous intervention. That is not the fasting that we're talking about for most of us, okay? So we're not suggesting anybody here go without food and water for 40 days. That'd be crazy. Okay? I think in the modern day they call that a hunger strike. That's not what we're talking about. But it's in there. David fasted for his little child when it was sick in Psalm 35, 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. And my prayer returned into mine own bosom. Psalm 69.10, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting that was to my reproach. Psalm 109.24, my knees are weak through fasting and my flesh faileth of fatness. Esther, if you know the story of Esther, called on her people to pray before she went in to see the king. In Esther 4.16, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days and nights or a day. And I and my young woman will also fast as you do. And then, and then will I go to the king. And though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. She was prepared to do something that she knew was illegal and threatened her life. And before she did it, she asked the people to pray and to fast for three days to humble themselves before God before she took a risk of her life. Nehemiah in 1.4 says, And it came to pass when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. In Daniel 9.3, I set my face upon the Lord to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Those are just five examples from the Old Testament. There are many more. But what about the New Testament? Is that just a Jewish thing that they did in the Old Testament and we don't have to worry about it anymore? Nope. Jesus said the day would come when his disciples would fast in Matthew chapter 9. And then came to him the disciples of John saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often but your disciples do not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. So Jesus predicted that when he was gone, then his disciples would fast. You might know the story of Cornelius the Roman centurion in Acts chapter 10. And he was fasting before God when the angel appeared to him and instructed for him to send for Peter so Peter could bring the gospel. Acts 10.30, and Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Even the Roman centurion knew to humble himself before God through fasting. In Acts 13, 
the disciples were fasting so that the Holy Spirit would direct them before their first missionary activity of the church. And as they ministered to the Lord in Acts 13, 2, and fasted, the Holy Ghost said to them, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent Barnabas and Saul away. The disciples fasted and prayed before ordaining the leaders of the church. In Acts 14, and when they had ordained elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. So there are other examples I could give. I figure nine's probably enough to know it happened, right? So then the question becomes, well, okay, Mike, I understand fasting is there, but why would I want to fast? Remember, fasting is the giving up of something, generally food, for the purpose of seeking God on some specific matter. It is the humbling of oneself before your maker. So there are many different reasons. Here's a few. Fasting is appropriate when mourning over a great pain or loss. Those of us that have lost loved ones in our lives know that when we are in great mourning, we don't really feel like eating. Very common reaction physically to emotional distress. Turn your lack of desire into fasting and bring your pain to God in the seeking of hope. You might recall that when we started the Sermon on the Mount, we talked about mourning. Blessed are those who mourn. And you might remember that didn't have to do with the loss of a loved one. It had to do with mourning over our own sin. So if you have ever faced a recurring sin and you struggle like an alcoholic, or someone addicted to food, or addicted to gossip, or addicted to pornography, or addicted to whatever addiction it is that ails you. If you're struggling with it, fast over it before the Lord. Spend time away from the things that you quote-unquote need in order to spend time doing what you absolutely need, which is to humble yourself before the Lord. Mourn over your own sin through fasting. You might recall that when Jesus was in the wilderness and being tempted by Satan for 40 days, he was fasting for 40 days. Similar to Moses, if you notice the time connection there. Also a miraculous morning, uh, fasting once again. I mentioned Esther. She was fasting specifically to seek God's favor in a desperate situation. Yesterday was a marvelous event. I don't know if you were able to make it. I know a bunch of you were there because I saw you, because I don't think I sat down for five hours. Boy, I was tired when I got home. And there wasn't a whole lot of fasting going on, Ted. There just wasn't. There were hot dogs being served. There was candy being distributed. There was a bouncy house that I don't know if anybody noticed, but after we shut down the bouncy house, one kid snuck in in the dark and kept bouncing. He goes, I just had to get two more shots in. So it was a massively marvelous event. My prayer is this, and I say this sincerely, that one day this week, you will fast for one day. And I'll talk about what I mean by that in a moment. That that outreach effort that we did translates into people coming into the church. Humble yourself before God. That all of the work, and there was a lot of work, 
that went into putting that together. Not just on the day of, but the days before. All of the displays and the trunks were just amazing. Now let's back that up with the humility of prayer. To bring all of those people that were exposed, I had a conversation with a lady, and I'm not sure I handled it the right way, but it was a lovely lady, and I said, you know, we, we get together for fun every Sunday morning at 10.30. I hope you'll come. And her first words out of her mouth were, you know, <laughs> that's like 30 minutes from here. And I suppose I could have handled it a little better than I did. Because <laughs> I said, well, I'm glad you're here today. All you have to do now is come back tomorrow. Again, I'm not sure that was the best response, but I have a really hard time when I see hypocrisy right in front of me to just keep my mouth shut. But we had a lovely conversation after that talking about what her spiritual life has been and what her spiritual life has not been. And she appreciated my candor. So I feel like ultimately it was a successful conversation. We hope that she comes. But isn't it funny the excuses that we give as people? Because in the midst of the conversation with her, she said, well, I usually just watch church from home. And I said, I, I appreciate that. I said, but how much fun would this be if all these people weren't here today? I'm so glad you came today. I hope you'll come again. Some of our family has been missing since COVID started, and it was wonderful to see some of them yesterday, and I was hoping to see some here today, because we missed them. Fasting is appropriate when you are seeking wisdom and revelation from God. The two examples I gave you, Moses talking to God on Mount Sinai and the elders being appointed in Antioch by the disciples, they were seeking God's direction. After church today, we have a deacon's meeting. One of my words to them which I'll give now, is are we seeking the Lord enough in our prayer lives? Not just our own ideas, but His, for how to reintroduce our church to the community at large. How awesome would it be if you arrived here one Sunday and there was standing room only? I remind you that in 1975, the church records indicate that there were nearly a thousand people in this church, in a community that had probably half the number of houses it has today, 50 years later. And it takes a while to get started and up to speed, doesn't it? How many had a little trouble after all that work yesterday, a little slow coming out of bed this morning? You know, five, six, seven, eight, ten hands going around the sanctuary. And we're all older than we were in 1975. Some of us, like Patrick, weren't even born in 1975. But the work that we do or the work that we don't do in the next five years determines whether this church will be here for Patrick 